Hello, I'm Sentinel's Mike, and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Sentinel's Mike, and welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm very excited to speak to you. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So I always like to, first of all, talk about what people were aspiring to be when they're growing up. But you were born in Elmhurst, Illinois, and from six months old, you were performing professionally as an actress in commercials, diaper commercials, McDonald's, Best Buy. Oh, gosh. (laughs) In my interviews, I go all the way back. So you were born and then... (laughs) Yes, and then um, my mom was a print model and she put me in commercials when I was six months old. So I've been doing it my whole life. I'm unqualified to do anything else. (laughs) Well, that's one more thing than I'm qualified to do. So that's very impressive. (laughs) I'll take it. I'll take the wins I can get. I know, right? And then (laughs) when you're a little bit older, you start in a touring production of Annie. And I understand you actually did hundreds of shows. Yes, I believe it was 487 to be exact. Wow. Uh, Molly and Annie for 13 months. Uh, We toured all over the U.S. Um, I started the show when I was seven, although I auditioned when I was six and had to learn a pretty hard lesson because I flew out to New York and I auditioned and it went really well. But Martin Sharman, the director, said, you know, we can't bring you on tour until you're seven. So, you know, we'll call you before your seventh birthday and you can come on tour. And my mom being my mom after the audition said, okay, look, take the compliment. That was so kind of him to say that. Obviously they loved you, but you know, if he doesn't call, it's okay, right? So two weeks before my seventh birthday, they called and flew me to New York and that was it. Since you were (laughs) in hundreds of performances of that show, have you ever gone to watch anybody else perform Annie or is it so ingrained in your brain that you just can't Mm -hmm. watch it now? Uh, I've never actually gone to a play, like a, a live performance of it. I've watched the movie. I've watched that they did the live Annie. Was it a few years back? Yeah. I saw that, which was fun. But there is a bit of me that has like a twitch when I hear any songs, you know, because it was, there was, there were so many nights, so many days of hearing that music over and over and over again. So it's not something I would necessarily seek out, although I hear it's coming to Los Angeles, to the Dolby in the fall. So maybe. Perfect. Yeah. I thought I knew what your first movie role was, but it's actually a few years before what I thought the movie was. So I'm going to go back to the Blues Brothers. 1980, you were dancing on the Bluesmobile. How did that first come about? I was. So uh, I auditioned for it. it there were six, week, uh, six weeks of dance rehearsals because it was, you know, the sequence with Ray Charles where he's playing Shake a Tail Feather. Yeah. So I booked the role, um, six weeks of dance rehearsals. And then that was the middle of the winter, froze my ass off. Uh, I remember... Uh, <laughs> so I was I was five at the time that we shot it. I was really young. And I remember I was dancing on John Belushi's car on the Bluesmobile. And I really had to pee. And I didn't know what to do. And there was so much going on that um, I ended up peeing right on the car. So <laughs> that happened. And then Wardrobe had to come in and change me and everything that was fine. And John Lane was actually was so charming and sweet about it and he kept in touch with me for a really long time he even wrote my college recommendation and kept in touch with my mom and would send me gifts and everything so he was lovely um but it wasn't wasn't a bad way to sort of step into films no not at all and now if you see the movie you can think well i peed on that car right exactly and that's kind of my thing and how many people can say that well (laughs) everybody can say it but for you it's true it's true that's true yeah fair (laughs) Now, what I originally thought to be your first movie, Things Are Tough All Over, is yeah. the one you're credited for IMDb and stuff like that. You have to do the extra research to find out the Blues Brothers stuff. You like to go just a little bit deeper, don't you? A little bit. <laughs> I assume that Things Are Tough All Over was your first movie, but just to check, I watched every other movie ever made just to make sure. The depth of your research, Sarah, I appreciate yeah. it. So the scene you're in is in a laundromat, and uh-huh. Cheech and Chong are there, and Cheech is half naked. How did they go about, because you were really young at the time, how did they go about filming that so that you didn't see anything? Or... Very carefully. Cheech right. was super respectful. And anytime he had to get in or out of the dryer or the washing machine that he was in, he made sure that I wasn't standing right there to essentially see him in a sock. 
Um, they, they honestly could not have been lovelier. They, I remember they sat and they had lunch with us, which is not usually something, you know, number one and two on the call sheet do. But they sat and had lunch with us and they were lovely. And Cheech was just super protective. Like he never, he was very aware of the fact that I was young, seeing things that were happening. Of course. Yeah. And so you starred in so many movies when you were a kid. You also starred in DC Cab. Yes. And I have two questions about that. One, did you get the chance to meet Mr. T because you're not in a scene with him? But also, have you been tempted to throw any eggs at taxis ever since? See, it, it's, there's an inclination there always. It's always just sort of like underneath the surface to just yeah. throw it. But I've held, I've held off. Um, I did get to meet Mr. T and he was, um, yeah, he's kind of as great as you can imagine, just a big teddy bear and I loved working with him. And uh, I loved working on that movie. I remember, so that was the first time I ever got to swear on screen. Um, I got to say the word bitch. And it was a really big deal because I was 11. And yeah, the social worker didn't want me to say it. And um, Joel Schumacher, the director, sort of walked over to my mother and said, okay, do you do you have a problem with your daughter saying this word? And my mom was like, I don't know, Santa, do you want to say it? And I said, yeah, I'd like to say it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah, so it was it was really fun to play that scene. And just that cast was extraordinary, extraordinary. And just, you know, Joel Schumacher's not too shabby either. I know, right? Right, and yeah. So now we move on to what I considered at the time when it came out to be the biggest film on the planet. Home Alone. Yeah. I was a kid when it came out and, I was, you know, I was a perfect age for it and stuff. Can you tell me how you first heard about that movie? It was just the audition process. It was Jimmy Jenkins and Janet Christensen were the casting directors. And when I was growing up, I grew up in Chicago. And, you know, whenever there would be an audition for a film or a TV show, I ended up flying to New York or Los Angeles to audition. But that one was auditioning in Chicago. So I went in for an audition and then got a call back and met Chris and then got a, a second call back and did sort of like a mix and match with the family members. And, and that was it. It was just the very typical audition process to get into that movie. And it was, it was fun. I remember it just being just crazy. I mean, how could it not be with all those people and characters and kids and insanity? Yeah, yeah it must have been chaos. And one of your very first scenes is with Joe Pesci. Yeah, a lovely Joe Pesci. I just saw that he's like coming back to television to work on a series, and I'm and Daniel Stern. Like they're both like they just both been cast in TV shows, and I'm so excited to see that. They're so great. They're so okay. good in everything that they do. Yeah. Joe Pesci is just he's hysterical. I mean, it was it was a bit of a challenge for him to you know keep the f bombs under control around all the kids, but uh, yeah, he was great. He was great. Yeah, because his movies, he either has the best sense of humor or he's the scariest person in the entire film. The one person you want to see, right? No. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, in, in real life, he's actually a very kind person with a wonderful sense of humor. So it's a huge relief. Yeah. And so <laughs> when you when you signed up to the original movie, was there an idea at the time that this film was going to be huge and there could be a sequel? Had you already signed on to part two? Yeah, you know what? I believe in the initial contract. The sequel was in there as something like if we did another, we would be in it. Um, but I don't, I don't think any of us expected it to be a huge hit. You know, it was just fun to make, and when it came out, you know, we were excited that it did so well. And I don't think, I don't think it really occurred to me how well it had done until we started making the second movie. And Matt had like an entourage of security, and we're staying at the plaza and shooting in New York. Like it just. The entire atmosphere of the set was on a completely different level for the second than the first. Right. Because I was going to ask, actually, because in the first film, I assume you didn't actually fly to Paris, but you did actually go to New York. And how much did that suck? Like, fly us to Paris, right? Yeah. Fly us to Paris. Yeah, no, that was, it was all shot in Illinois, you know, with that car, like the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, but in, in the second one, we actually got to go to New York. So that was fun. Of all of the cast members in yeah. Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, I was really hoping that the pigeon lady would become president and not anybody else. I know. Or Tim Curry, one of the two. Oh, yeah. Tim Curry would have been amazing. He would have had my vote like that. I know. So I'm still kind of hoping that happens. Maybe. You never know. Is it true, by the way, that Michael Jackson visited the set too? He did during the second one. Yeah, we were shooting at the house in Winneka, yeah. and this 
white van pulled up with no windows and he got out and he hung out with us all day just hung out with the cast while we were shooting and he was just spending time with Mac and just, yeah, sweet and giggly. It must have been quite an unsafe car to drive if it had no windows. Well, I would hope, I mean, there was a windshield. Oh, there yeah. was what she- right. the windshield. <laughs> the rest of it was super, yeah, fair point though, Sarah. He, he was just in a metal dome with wheels on it. Just traveling. Yeah. And, and just, you know, there was like a little scope up the top, sort of like checking everything out. Yeah. So it was kind of like a submarine. Exactly like a submarine, but with wheels. Yeah. Less water. That too, yeah. I'm sure you think about this all the time. What do you imagine Tracy McAllister is doing now? Oh, gee, Tracy McAllister would be doing that. That's a really good question. Well, if I remember correctly, my character was very obsessed with like shampoo and what she was wearing and all of that. So maybe she owns her own like clothing line or hair salon or something like that. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. I mean, she was Uncle Frank's daughter, so, you know, she's got stuff to prove. That must have been fun. <sighs> <laughs> Uncle Frank. Uncle Frank. <laughs> so if they found a reason for the original cast to come back for a new adventure, I kind of worked out the Wet Bandits would be out of prison now. Would that be something you'd be up for? Oh, in a second. Actually, we just had a like a Zoom reunion with the family. Uh, some of the family, I should say, over Christmas. And it just made me miss them all the more. So, yeah, I'm in if they want to do it. Amazing. Did you ever see any of the other sequels? There, there were several of them, and they've just done a recent reboot as well. I have to be honest, the only time we ever watched the first two, the ones that I was in, are when I'm doing the interview specifically about them because my brain is old and I don't remember things. So I have to watch the movies to remind myself what I did. <laughs> But I don't, yeah, no, I haven't. My Christmas movie is a Christmas story. Like, that's the one that I watch every single year, like Blackboard. Mine are always National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Uh, right, so good. Home Alone, Scrooge, Elf, and oh. Santa Claus the Movie. Oh, yes. Can we talk about Carol Kane for a second and Scrooge? Uh-huh. I'm obsessed with her. I'm obsessed with that woman. And just Amazing. Her abilities, yeah. So yeah. So in addition to repeatedly misplacing your brother, you're also a world famous scientist because you played Phoebe in 25 episodes of Beatman's World. Such a fun show and such a great way of educating kids about science. Yeah, it was kind of like Mr. Ed on acid. Like it was really intense and in your face, and we were talking right to the camera. We were doing these experience. Uh, experiments and there were live animals on the set like I worked with a lion and a chimpanzee and a camel and an elephant it was it was insane absolutely insane yeah my show used to be like that too but I found it quite hard to do the interview so now that the lion and the giraffe just wait in the kitchen well I understand that they can be very distracting and needy they can they're, 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 kind of needy too. they're so needy so needy <laughs> so you appeared in a ton of TV shows in the 1990s. You're in six episodes of Sister, Sister, which instantly I just went back and rewatched. Such a funny show. Love it. It's on yeah. Netflix in the UK if people want to watch that. You were in Running the Halls, Party of Five, Everybody Loves Raymond, My So-Called Life. Have you got a particular favourite out of those from that time period? Oh, I have to say My So-Called Life. I love them all, but that one, I mean, that one was like working with family. It's such a It holds such a special place in my heart, playing that character and having those moments with Wilson Cruz and um, just getting to know everyone and working with Winnie Goldsman, who my character was based on, and Ed Swick. Like, just, it was like a murder's row of talent that I got to work with. So I would say probably that one, although, you know, the others were wonderful as well. Absolutely. Now, in 1999, you starred in Tequila Body Shots. Oh, not a porn, not a porn. So I'm just going to throw that out there right now. It's not. It's no. <laughs> well, I suppose anything is dependent on how you look at it. It's true. It's true. Yeah. I just want to send that out there in case my mother does watch this interview. Just yeah, to I hope so, because then I'll have a viewer and that'd be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you start in tequila body shots, but my question to you is this. Can you yeah. tell me what your favorite beverage is? Diet Coke. Diet Coke? It is my drug of choice. I mean, it is like, 
It is the nectar of the gods. It, there was a, very, a period of time where I didn't drink it. It was like a year and a half and it was a dark period in my life. And I don't know what I was thinking. And now I'm back to drinking it again and all is right in the world. I'm similar, but I'm not Diet Coke. I'm Pepsi Max kind of person, but that. Interview over. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. But, <laughs> really? But here's the important thing with that, because if we like the same thing, there'd be less of it. So I think it's always good when somebody enjoys a different drink to me because it means that I'm less likely to run out of it. Oh, okay. Because there'll be some of it in your fridge because you won't be drinking it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So with the Pepsi Max, like, did you, how does one get into Pepsi Max? I tend to either take the lid off the bottle or open the can. That's how I get yeah. into it personally. That's very well. Right into that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Were you drinking regular Pepsi or Diet yeah. Pepsi? No, no. Like, my generation so, so when I was at college I used to drink full fat coke all the time like I had no awareness of sugar yeah. is a thing yeah. and, and then I noticed just when I looked down that that wasn't so good I just kind of particularly like the taste of Pepsi Max I'm not too bothered about any other Pepsis or anything yeah. but I seem to like it okay yeah I eat like a third grader I mean it's yeah. true if it's on a kid's menu, that's that's what I love to eat. So it's where the best stuff is, and you sometimes get crayons or a toy. Oh, lovely! Right, or like a, a game where you can like connect numbers. Or yeah, lovely. And because it's less calories, of course, you can order three of them. It's great. You're right. You're right. Yeah, and a lot of them will come with a drink or like a dessert. Like it's kind of like a complete experience, and not yeah. just so you know, it's amazing. So speaking of which, you used to be in a comedy troupe. Is that something you'd, you'd like to do more of? Yes. Now, so are you talking about the one at USC called Comedis Interruptus, or are you talking about the Second City troupe? I think you're at, like, college or something doing it. Yeah, That's so at, U at USC, I was right. in a prop troupe called Comedis Interruptus, and we performed every Friday on the lawn in front of the library, and that was an absolute blast. One of my best friends in the whole world were in that group. Um, and yeah, that's something that I would totally do again. I did the Second City Conservatory program probably four or five years ago, and I was part of a improv troupe with that. That was really fun too. Amazing. So yeah, it was just kind of, kind of, kind of a thing. It's so much fun, and yeah, I I'd love to see you do that live one day if you ever do more of it. Thanks. Oh, I improvise in my home all the time. It's, it's the best so way, cool. and it's quite hard not to actually because. There's very few situations in your house that you have a script. It's true. Yeah. And I give good suggestions. So like I always sort of like, you know, tee myself up for the perfect joke. <laughs> it's a good thing to do. <laughs> so you starred in 41 episodes of General Hospital, playing oh, yeah. an FBI agent. And so I've spoken to people before who have been in daytime soap operas. And they always tell me that compared to other TV shows or movies, the shooting schedule is usually quite intense. Is that what the situation was like for you as well? Oh, yeah. It's it's brutal. It's yeah. absolutely brutal. Um, the worst it ever was for me was 42 pages in one day. And that was 42 pages of me speaking, like me wow. and one other person in a scene. And I got the script the night before. So it is really just kind of, it's like boot camp. Like you are in it, you're in it deep. It's like fast and furious. You get one, maybe two takes. The only time you get a second take is if you screw up royally. Like oftentimes we would do a scene, um, Bradford and I like, played opposite uh, a lot. And afterwards we would sort of look at each other and say, okay, so that happened. And then we would move on because they just, they just go, they just move. How do you even cope with that amount of dialogue? Is it possible to learn 40 pages in one day? Or was it just you'd read a few lines, say it, record the next bit? and? No, you know what? I think memorizing is just sort of a skill that you develop. It's something mm -hmm. that I've always, I wouldn't say it comes super easy to me because I work on it, but it's something that I can do. So I, my brain is trained to remember a lot quickly and then it's gone which is right. frustrating to some of my friends because I can't remember plots of movies that I saw like last week or books that I read four days ago or lines that I said because my brain is just sort of like yeah shuttling it through. So it was challenging. The, the good thing about doing a soap is then you go on and you do other shows and you're like four pages of dialogue, please, child, <laughs> come on, you know, just whatever, up to the pages, don't even care. I got it. So that was definitely a 
Yeah, so it's, it's actually improved your experience working on everything else, which is fantastic. Well, just because everything feels, it, it feels like a luxury to have a week to work on four pages, you know, it, it, which I never had before. With, with a soap, you have to make choices, which is also a good lesson for an actor. You have to make choices for the character in terms of objective and obstacle real quickly because you don't have time to, you know, go crazy about it. In 2015, I was delighted to see you appear in an episode of Girl Meets World. Were you a big fan of the original show? You know what? I, I didn't watch the original, but um, the Savage Brothers were very much a part of my childhood because I grew up in Chicago. Like I did, I think I did a bank commercial with Fred and Ben was always around. So it was a little bit kind of fun to be back there on set with them again. Um, but then I didn't, I didn't watch the original. I, I think it might've just sort of been after you know, a little bit after when I was growing up in that show would have been, yeah, great for me. Absolutely. And so very recently, finally, Paramount Plus has launched in the UK quite a long time after it did in the US. And so one of my favorite things to do is to browse any streaming platform and find something not necessarily new, but just something that I missed the first time it came around. Yeah. So there was a show called Faking It. And I love the premise of it. And I watched the first episode. Now there's a lot of TV shows that I start watching that I never see more than the first episode at all. I'm like, just like, I didn't get into it. I'm not really feeling the characters. I watched all 38 episodes before I watched any other TV show. Uh, I love to hear that. That that project is so special to me. One of my best friends in the whole world, Carter Covington, was the showrunner and executive producer. And it was just... It was perfect. It was an absolute perfect experience. I didn't have to audition for that. He called me and he's like, hey, do you want to come play the principal? I was like, yes, don't even have to ask me twice. And I worked with Carter and his husband, Sean, on Greek. So it was like basically walking onto a set of people that I already knew and loved and just everything that that show dealt with um, is so important to me and something that um, yeah, it just, it, it meant a lot to be a part of that show. And it was just really fun. Like the crew was awesome. It, it The grip department made me an Apple box with my name on it. Because I was <laughs> always on one because I'm so short. Um, but it was just, yeah, it was, it was perfect. Yeah, I love that. So you played Principal Penelope. Okay. Can you tell me your favorite moments or scenes that you worked on? Oh, I loved the scene where I finally told off uh, the principal that came in to replace me, like I got demoted. I can't remember what his character's name was, but I remember when I basically told him to, you know, F off and that I quit. That was super fun to do. Um, there were so many good moments from that show. They just gave me the best lines. Like, and, and, and then it was playtime too. You know, like Carter is so supportive that I knew that anything, I, if I wanted to take really big swings and moments, he was super supportive of it. And the writers, said, yeah. Oh, their favorite moment. Jeez, there's so many of them. I think I'm just going to stick with the one where I got to quit and I got to say the F bomb on television. You see a pattern here? I'm just seeing one, yes. These are your career milestones. Yeah, they are. I'm just swearing. Yeah. <laughs> if there's any words you haven't said yet, feel free to just let them out of your system. Just drop them. Like, yeah. Pull a George Carlin right here on your show yeah. and just drop them all. <laughs> five minutes, we'll go for it. We'll try and beat South Park's record. Amazing. Best interview ever. <laughs> So Faking It was such an inclusive and at the time groundbreaking show as well. Did you have many people reaching out to you where particular storylines really resonated with them? I did, yeah. You know, so I joined Twitter when I got on that show because it was sort of like a requirement. And there were so many moments where I got to interact with people that watched the show that had I not been on Twitter, I wouldn't have been able to. And we would often live tweet the episodes as they were airing, or if something big happened, I would have people tweeting me and asking me questions or asking me, you know, like, who do I ship? Which characters did I like together? And uh, yeah. I got real hit for a second there, and then it's it's all gone again. But <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was a really fun. That was the really fun part of being on that show in sort of like the time of social media, because a lot of the other shows that I was on um, that had that sort of effect on people who watched it, it was before Twitter, before Facebook. So there wasn't that interaction where people could say, you know, oh, this moment, oh, and like all of that stuff. Um, the only show that that's ever happened with 
is my soap of life, but that's even after the fact because people are rewatching it. So they're bringing mm. that on Twitter. Oh, instantly. Bella and the Bulldogs is also available on Paramount Plus. So if you're going there to watch Faking It, you can watch that too. Another really fun show. And you can just like have a whole weekend of me. I have. <laughs> That has literally happened. I've watched that pretty much everything you've ever been in. Just for your, you're really good at preparation, Sarah. Well, so this is the thing. It's really important to me. I only invite people on my show if I'm willing to spend a week watching their stuff. So I have to love everything that they do. And I love everything that you've done. So it's really an excuse for me to rewatch it and then chat to you about it afterwards. I love that though. You've got sort of standards of who you, people, who you want to talk to. Yeah, because, I, you know, I don't have to interview anybody that I don't want to at all. So the, the entire show is just people that I love, which is amazing. That's cool. That's so cool. I think so. And um, Have you ever had the chance to keep any props or souvenirs or costumes from any of the TV shows or films that you've worked on or not even had the opportunity to keep them but have kept them? Oh, I'm not great at stealing props because I, I, I get, like, real guilt-ridden and then it just goes south. But um, I always ask for things. Like I'll ask, uh, on Greek, I got uh, a Zeta Beta pin. And for faking it, there was an episode where we had a bunch of um, pins with labels of who we were, like principal and like everything. Yeah. That we were. I, I, have, I have a few of those pins, which was fun. Um, I have a rubber chicken from Beatman's World. I have, um, oh, the brush I used during Hard Knock Life on uh, from Annie I guess the, the, the answer to your question is yeah I keep a lot of shit I <laughs> just I have it all <laughs> it's all in my cabinets in my family room to sort of display and to remind me of just how lucky I am to be doing this I love that and I recently discovered you starred in a really fun web series called Badge of a Quitter which you co-created co-wrote with Carla Kukowski yeah. can you tell me how that first came about Sure, yeah. So Carla was actually my teacher in the final level of grad review at Second City. Oh, wow. And, yeah, a few months after I was through the program and it was over, she sent me an email and said, you know, I feel like we have a common sensibility. Like we both sort of agree on certain things that are funny and certain things that aren't. Would you want to collaborate on something? And Carla's a genius. So I said, yes. Uh, and she said, so I have this idea about a woman going back to Girl Scouts. And I said, I mean, like, I'm so in, that's genius. So we flushed out everything, like the who, the what, the where, the why, and we wrote it over the course of, I think, three months, three or four months. And then we just wrote checks out of our accounts and financed it ourselves and asked our friends to come play. Uh, the little girls were all cast by Kendra Shea Clark. She's a casting director here. Um, but, like, the adults was just us. Like the, the man that plays the troop leader, Michael Cornaccia, we went to college together. Um, the the uh, experts in, in, I think it was the fifth episode, Craig Kowski is married to Carla. Jamie Moyer taught at Second City. Uh, Mark Evan Jackson was my Second City level one teacher. So it was like, it's just this sort of like perfect world where we could bring in people that we loved. Yeah. Yeah, Lori Fortier was from Running the Halls. Charlie, who played my husband, was from Bella and the Bulldogs. It's super incestuous. <laughs> I love that. It really is a great show, and it's available to watch just for free on YouTube. And there's yeah. six episodes, and they're about six minutes each, aren't they? So you, you can watch them all in one go. And yeah, check it out. Thank you. Very welcome. And so here's a question that I ask every guest on the Sarah O'Connell show. Does anybody get it right when you ask the question? Is that why you keep asking? No, I don't know what it is. So I, I just need your social security number. And right. that's, all the, that's all this whole thing has been. Just fake account all of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I do nothing with them. I haven't worked out what the next step is. I just know to do that. They never explain it when you send an email, do they? They, they ask for that detail and then they don't tell you what they do with it. So I don't have that skill set. And I would love that piece of information just to know. I know, it's outrageous. Anyway, here's the actual question. Yeah. You tell me a fun fact about you, something we may not know, a hobby, a party trick, something like that. Oh, mm. the one that always gives people pause about me is that I don't eat soup I can't see through. So like chicken noodle, wonton, where I can see underneath, I'm in, but anything yeah. where I can see what's happening under the surface, I'm out. So that would be sort of like a quirky thing. Um, a party trick. Oh, this is the worst one. It's stupid. I can do this. That's, that's all I got. 
I like that. That's great. I'm not going to be America's Got Talent anytime soon. <laughs> See, that's going to be great for the trailer. Oh, good. Okay, just just leave with that. <laughs> I, I, I might just do that clip on loop for like 10 hours or something. Perfect. Just on loop. Yeah. 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 Just some relaxing music. This I just found out today. I love your reimaginings of classic movies like Psycho and Rosemary's Baby and It on your YouTube channel. Have you considered doing any more like that? Because there are loads of fun. That was actually for the Second City Conservatory program. We put those three little bits uh, part of our grad review show. So they were sort of like in between as we were changing costumes and, you know, moving chairs around. Uh, so that's what I that's what I shot them for. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to find them. They're great. Well, they're accurate too, maybe. <laughs> Very accurate. They're more accurate than the real versions of the movies, I think. Yeah, scary. Yeah. yeah, and you have to go watch them to find out what I'm referring to or just read the news, I guess. Yeah, one of the two. <laughs> exactly. And can you tell me what you might be working on next, what we might see you in? Yeah, so I'm just, I'm back to auditioning. I have a, a Geico commercial I'm running it right now. A, that was hard to say. That kind of came out strange. A Geico commercial running now. And then, yeah, just auditioning for things. Episodics are starting to heat up a bit, so that's kind of fun. Um, that's, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing. And in between, I've been painting. I got into watercolors about four years ago, and I sell my paintings on Etsy to raise money for whatever charity I'm interested in this month. It's the Trevor Project, uh, and they support LGBTQ plus youth. So, yeah, keeping busy that way, doing some writing just to keep the creative juices flowing. That's fantastic. And can you tell me what kind of things you like painting? I've been doing these rain paintings where mm. I, I paint just a really basic scene, like a man with an umbrella in a forest or something like that. And then I do all of this distressing to it using salt and water and paint to make it look like it's raining. And that's, that's been really fun. That's amazing. So I'm going to have to go and check some of those out if I find any online as well. And people should support all your paintings and the amazing causes that you're helping to fund as well. Yeah. My final question. Have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? Okay, messages. Well, I would say please watch Sarah's show because clearly she's brilliant. And if you want to get a hold of me or communicate with me, find me on Twitter. I tend to answer those tweets that come to me. Highly recommend it. <laughs> so Santa Moses, thank you so much for coming on my show today. I've loved celebrating your career and all the amazing things you've started. in. Well, Sarah, thank you for having me. This has been really fun. You're, you're a little bit naughty and I like that. <laughs> I know. It's more fun, I think. It is, you're right. Yes. And you're welcome back anytime to tell me about any other productions that you've sworn in. All right. I will. Yeah, because there'll be more. I mean, it's just like yeah. I'm a track player, so it's bound to, to end up on video. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm going to get 4K versions of them now. I'll get a still book, <laughs> limited edition, just have a collection okay. of you swearing in various things. The director's cut of just, yeah, just all longer. That. Yeah. Four hour versions. <laughs> going to be spectacular and so thank you again for coming on my show thank you to everybody at home for watching be sure to share subscribe give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments and i'll see you all again soon for another episode of the sarah o'connell show bye okay, bye sarah this is really fun